society overly feminized? Well, I didn't ever say that society was overly feminized. So if we're going to discuss my views, we should use my actual words. I believe that there's a danger in our society at the moment of making the assumption that our culture, for example, is a tyrannical patriarchy. Just for clarity, do you think a trans woman is a real woman? <laughs> I don't really like the way those questions are formulated. You know, I don't know what that means. What do you mean a real woman? Well, people tend to confuse describing the likelihood of something with supporting the fact that it exists. And I'm describing the likelihood of something, not, not supporting the fact that it exists. If you push too far on the left, you're going to get a backlash on the right. That's how things work. And this is just a derivation of that, as far as I'm concerned. How does that work so, in domestic, in the context of domestic violence? Oh, I don't, I don't think it's applicable in the context of domestic violence at all. I don't, I think those things are, are completely separate issues. Yeah, let's like, let's have a real question. Can men and women work together in the workplace? Yes, I, how I do, you do it. How do you know? Because I work with a, a lot of women. Right, well, it's been happening for, what, 40 years? And, and things are deteriorating very rapidly at the moment in terms of the relationships between men and women. It's like we don't know if men and women can work together successfully. But in what in ways? Because like in, well, in, in like, the sexual like, harassment way. That there is plenty of evidence if you look at all the stories that are coming out. Do you, do you not feel like any of the stories that you've heard about what Hollywood is like? Do you feel like that's not evidence that this is a problem? Evidence that Hollywood is a problem? Yeah. Yeah, but when I look at Hollywood, all, all these people coming out of Hollywood talking about how sexual misbehavior is a problem. And I think people in Hollywood are talking about that. They've been capitalizing on sexual misbehavior for like a hundred years. Why do you think it is that so much of what you say is so very popular with the alt-right? It isn't. And you don't have any evidence for that at all? Uh, well, any I'm, more than the I'm, evidence that alt-right people Dave watch Stormer, this Daily Stormer, Neonite, yeah, website, Saviour of Western Civilization. Oh, well, there was, that was all taken apart today by a number of Jewish publications, by the way, showing that, first of all, that was all satirical commentary on the part of the alt-right, directed at taking me down, for example. And there was an alt-right article yesterday published t saying that I was a Jewish stooge and shill. So well, this is absolute nonsense, and I don't, uh, uh, I don't appeal primarily to the alt-right. There's no evidence for that at all. It's the, it's the no, proclivity of... I never said, I never said, pr pr I never said primarily, yeah. um, Jordan. What I'm interested in is why you think that you get the reaction that you do from the alt-right, looking at, you know, the Kathy Newman documentary. Uh, what the reaction? Get into interview. There's 10 there million people lot, watched that and commented awful, on it. I'm, I'm talking about what I saw, mm. and I'm curious to know what your reaction was to the, to the, to the glee with which the alt-right seized upon uh, that issue. Well, I don't shall accept we, the, we deal with the death threats? I mean, she had, yeah, I think, a dozen I don't accept the threats. concept that it was the alt-right that was doing this. There were 10 million people who commented on that video, and about 95% of them commented negatively on Kathy Newman's behavior. You think there's 10 million alt-right trolls watching that? I mean, that's, so that's my idea of the patriarchy, which is a, a system of male dominance of society. Yeah, but that's not my sense of the patriarchy. So what's, what's yours? Well, in what sense is our society male-dominated? Uh, the fact that the vast majority of wealth is owned by men, the vast majority of capital um, is owned by men. Women do more unpaid it's a very, labor. a very tiny proportion of men and a huge proportion of people who are seriously disaffected are men. Most people in prison are men. Most people who are uh, on the street are men. Most victims of violent crime are men. Most people who commit suicide are men. Uh, most men, most people who die in wars are men. People who do worse in school are men. It's like, where's the dominance here precisely? What you're doing is you're taking a tiny substrata of hyper successful men and using that to represent the entire structure of, the, of Western society. There's nothing about that that's vaguely appropriate. But I could say equally well that most rape victims are women. You know, terrible things happen to people of both sexes. And you could say that with, with, with perfect utility, but that doesn't provide any evidence for the existence of a male-dominated patriarchy. Well, there it are... just means that terrible things happen to both genders, which they certainly do. But there are almost no women who rape men, for example. So that is an asymmetry there in sexual violence. Well, yes, there's an, as there's an asymmetry in all sorts of places, but that doesn't mean that Western culture is a male-dominated patriarchy. The fact that there are asymmetries has nothing to do with your basic argument. No, but you might... This, equally... is, this is a trope that people just accept. Western society is a male-dominated patriarchy. It's like, no, it's not. That's not true. And, and even, if it, even if it has a patriarchal structure to some degree, the, uh, 
The fundamental basis of that structure is not power, it's competence. Like the analysis that was done by um, the American Psychological Society, which looked at 45 analysis of se whether there's sex difference over 20 years. And its conclusion was that men and women are basically alike in terms of personality, in terms of cognitive ability, in terms of leadership. But what it did find was that media depictions of men and women as fundamentally different perpetuate misconceptions, as does workplace violence. Oh, God, so it's my fault. So. No, well, you know, you're leaving soon, it's okay. <laughs> men and women, men and women actually are more the same than they are different. But the issue is, is that small differences at the population level can turn into very large differences at the extreme. So, for example, men and women are broadly similar with regards to aggression, although men tilt a little bit more towards aggression. About So that if you picked a random person out of the population, male and female, and you guessed that the male was more aggressive, you'd be right 60% of the time. But if you take the one in a hundred most aggressive people, they're all male. And that's why the overwhelming proportion of people who are in prisons are male. Now, do you want to equalize that, just out of curiosity? Uh, what about bricklayers? They're 99% male. And, the, and we've got about three quarters of, of the population now in universities, in the humanities and social sciences are female. Yeah. Are we going to equalize that? And men, men work more longer hours, they work more dangerous jobs, they're more likely to move, they're more likely to work outside, they're more likely to participate in jobs in the STEM fields that are scalable, they make more money for those reasons. And that's all hidden under the idea that the reason that men and women make different amounts of money is because of their gender. It's a very simplistic analysis. I mean, otherwise, why would there only be seven women running FTSE 100 companies in the UK? Why, why would there still be a pay gap, which we've discussed oh, well, that's at easy. length? That's easy why are women at the question. BBC saying that they're getting paid illegally less than men to do the same job? Well, let's, that's not fair, well, is let's it? Let's go to the first question. They're both those are complicated questions. Seven, seven women, re repeat that one. There's seven women seven. running the top FTSE 100 companies in the UK. Okay. Well, the I first, mean, the first question might be, um, why would you want to do that? Why would a man, man want to do it? I well, mean, there's there a lot are, of money, it's certain, an interesting there's job. There's a certain you know? number of, of men, although not that many, who are perfectly willing to sacrifice virtually all of their life to the pursuit of a high-end career. So they'll work. These are men that are very intelligent. They're usually very, very conscientious. They're very driven. They're very high energy. They're very healthy. And they're willing to work 70 or 80 hours a week, non-stop, specialized at one thing to get to the top. So you're saying women are just more sensible. They don't want that because it's not a nice life. I'm saying that's part of it, definitely. And so I work so you, for- So you don't think there are barriers in their way that prevent them getting to the top oh, of Oh, there are companies. some barriers, yeah. Like other, like men, for example. I mean, to get to the top of any organization is an incredibly competitive enterprise. And the men that you're competing with are simply not going to roll over and say, please take the position. So it's, let me come back to my question. It's absolute all out warfare. Why is society overly feminized? Well, I didn't ever say that society was overly feminized. So if we're going to discuss my views, we should use my actual words. I believe that there's a danger in our society at the moment of making the assumption that our culture, for example, is a tyrannical patriarchy, which it is in some small part, and that any active um, engagement on the part of young men in particular is indistinguishable from an unacceptable power and dominance drive, which I don't believe. But surely if, all if, of that if, is if, inappropriate if, and incorrect. If much of the power and authority over a very long historical period has lain with men, isn't it only inevitable that some men will get a little hacked off when women are given a, a, a stab at something approaching equality? Well, that could be inevitable, but that doesn't make it right, and it's certainly not something that I support. So, my, my so you think men's resentment is more I'm important not than women's effort to attain equality? I'm not in favor of resentment at all. I think that if you're resentful, something's, something's definitely wrong. Either you need to grow the hell up and, and, and take stock of your life, or you have some things to say to people that you haven't been saying. You say science undoubtedly shows us that men and women have different traits, and there's a lot of science to, to back you up on mm -hmm. that, but you say that because of that, men are hardwired to achieve success and to be successful in a way that women are not? No, not at all. I've never said anything like that. I've said that there are biological differences between men and women that express themselves in temperament and, and in occupational choice, and that any attempt to enforce equality of outcome is unwarranted and ill-advised as a consequence.
You point out that in Scandinavia, many more women choose to be health workers than engineers, for example. It's not what but, I say, it's what the large-scale scientific no, investigation fair, has revealed. Fair enough. But equally, Scandinavia is full of societies, one could point to Norway, where they've made a specific legislative effort, for example, with a quota of 40% of women on corporate boards or a quota for women to be in parliament. Right. They've, they've specifically engaged in social engineering, and it seems to be working, and it seems it to be... It doesn't seem to be working. Well, Forgive me, but Norway is top of every contentment index that we see across the world. Well, okay, so first of all, Norway has plenty of oil money, which is definitely contributing to that. And second, it depends on what you mean by working. There's no evidence, for example, that the legislation that was designed to increase the number of women on boards has produced any movement whatsoever in the number of pe women who hold managerial and administrative positions in Norway. The theory was that as societies became more egalitarian, that men and women would become more the same. That isn't what's happened. What's happened is the biggest differences between men and women now, temperamentally and in terms of their own interest, have manifested themselves in the Scandinavian countries. And so what that will mean is that men and women will make different choices in occupation if you let them have free choice. Now, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to stop that from happening? Is that the feminist perspective? Let's get back to a word I used before and ask you directly, do you approve of do you think it's a dangerous word, equality? This word equality, what is your... I do approve of equality of opportunity, but I think that equality of outcome considerations are detestable and dangerous beyond belief. Just for clarity, do you think a trans woman is a real woman? <laughs> I don't really like the way those questions are formulated. You know, I don't know what that means. What do you mean a real woman? Well, she I'm asking you, in your mind, you know, it depends what you think a real woman is, but do you think a trans woman is a woman? No. Why not? Because I think that women are capable, generally speaking, of having babies and they have female genitalia and they have an XX chromosome and, and I think the biological markers are relevant. It doesn't necessarily mean that I don't think that people should be treated with respect and dignity if they happen not to fit easily into a gender category. That's a different issue. Right. But, but it's a matter of definition. And, and I actually think it's a foolish argument in some sense, because what do you mean by real? Well, I mean, you've just clarified that, though. You, you, you don't think um, that a trans woman is a woman. And do you, do you think that that is what is behind or explains your opposition to this idea of a law mandating you to use a no. preferred pronoun is because you don't actually believe that that's the truth, that a trans woman is a woman and therefore you can't use that pronoun? No, that's not my argument at really? all. Really? Yeah, really. My yeah, argument is that the no, government I know what your shouldn't compel is. voluntary speech. No, but I know what your argument is, and no, you've made it very really clearly. It. No, but, but behind, that's exactly it. There's but the no motivation behind, behind, behind no motivation it. There's no motivation behind it. But you don't believe I wouldn't have put everything on my li online in my life to take the stance I did, unless I had thought that through very deeply. And I've thought it through very deeply. There aren't hidden motivations that have to do with some arbitrary prejudice against trans people. Okay. It's purely, pure and simply this. There's never been a time in English common law history where the government compelled speech and the Canadian government dared to do that. And that was unacceptable. And they masked it with this show of, of compassion for the oppressed and I don't buy it. Everybody has a lot to gain mm. by greater equality. Now, whether you get the equality of outcome that you want, I think only time will tell. But certainly, equality of opportunity is, is very important. And actually, no, a, lot, and a lot of men would, would benefit from that. So I think a lot of men, men are having a lot of crises at the moment in terms of mental, mental health, suicide yeah. issues, um, their own sense of identity, because I think some of the stereotypes put on men are quite limiting for them as well. I think they make men quite unhappy as well. The so, devil's in the details with regards to equality, because I'm a, an advocate of equality of opportunity. But and I outcomes. Think the idea, outcomes, that's an appalling doctrine. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Because well, you have to produce an unbelievably potent bureaucracy to make the ever greater and ever finer distinctions that are necessary to enforce equality of outcome. How many group differences are you going to equalize across? Is it just gender and sex? How many genders? No, so gender and ethnicity? How many genders? I think How many what, ethnicities? What How many races? <laughs> I think we have a long way to go to see where it plays out. There is no country in the world where you know we really do have gender equality um, properly yet in terms of 
dis real decision making and, and real Some of the power. Scandinavian countries maybe? But I, th they're still not quite there and I think All you've right. spoken a lot about this. Scandin there's still a way to go in Scandinavia. Things are not perfect well, in I Scandinavia at all. Well I haven't spoken about that specifically. I've spoken about you spoke the... about the right stuff yesterday. I, you talked about the Scandinavian. Well I've spoken about the fact that, see, one of the things that's happened in the analysis of the differences between men and women is that the social constructionist claim is that mm. the differences are socially constructed, mm. right? Is that it's a consequence of environment that men and women differ. But what the scientific literature indicates is that as cultures become more egalitarian, like they have in Scandinavia, the differences between men and women actually increase rather than decreasing, which is a direct repost to the social constructionist view. So they just deny all that. The biggest differences in the world in interest and temperament are between Scandinavian men and women. It's exactly the opposite of what everyone predicted. Trudeau, Justin has no training for this, no experience. He's not, he's a part-time drama teacher. He just didn't know enough to be prime minister. Jordan Peterson doesn't hold back with a scathing critique of Justin Trudeau. Watch till the end to discover his analysis and why he's become a lightning rod for controversy in the Canadian political landscape. Trudeau wants the best for this country and actually might do good things for this country as okay. an intellectual challenge. Sure. Um, he seems to get along well with his wife. He has some kids. There's no sexual scandals. And he's in a position where that could easily be the case. He seems to have done some good things on the oceanic management front. He's put a fair bit of Canada's oceans into marine protected areas, and that might be his most fundamental legacy, if it's real. I've been trying to get information about the actual reality of the protection, and I haven't been able to do that. But that's a good thing. Despite the heated nature of their public disagreements, Peterson has also acknowledged the formidable political skills and widespread appeal of Trudeau, recognizing his ability to connect with voters and rally support for his progressive agenda. How can discourse in a great democracy have become so polarized that Jordan Peterson and the Prime Minister look at exactly the same set of events and come to opposite conclusions about them? Well, he's lying, and I'm not. So that's a big part of the that's a big part of the issue. I don't believe that he ever says a word that's true. From what I've been able to observe, it's all stage acting. He's crafted a persona. He has a particular instrumental goal in mind, and everything is subordinated to serve that. And Why? So, What's the motivation? Uh, the same motivation that generally, that's generally typical of people who are narcissistic, which is to uh, be accredited with moral virtue in the absence of the work necessary to actually attain it. All right. From He's playing a role. Jordan Peterson's opinion of Justin Trudeau is colored by his deep concern for Canada's future. And he's spoken out forcefully against what he sees as Trudeau's misguided and dangerous policies. Well, after the Liberals had brought in a Harvard intellectual who was a Canadian to be their last leader, he didn't work out. And then they're flailing about for a leader. And the Liberals in Canada are pretty good at maintaining power and leadership and have been the dominant governing party in Canada for a long time. And so they went to Justin and said, well, you know, it's you are a conservative. And you can imagine that's not a positive um, specter for someone who's on the left or even a liberal, especially, and Trudeau is quite a bit on the left. And uh, they said, we need you to run. And then I thought, okay, well, the answer to that should have been no, because the Trudeau, Justin has no training for this, no experience. He's not... He was a part-time drama teacher, fundamentally. He hadn't run a business. He just didn't know enough to be prime minister. Because there is a personality trait that is uniting diverse policy decisions that isn't ideational or ideological even. It is, in fact, personal. And so my sense of Trudeau, initially, I was very upset with it, with his decision to run for prime minister because I thought, well, you don't know anything. and you're attractive and you can behave well in public and you and you have a, a charming facade but you don't know anything in any real sense and there's no and there's no indication that you do you, you're not particularly well educated and you're not particularly accomplished and this is actually a hard job but worse than that 
The only reason you even have the vaguest possibility of succeeding is because you have the same last name as your father. And so, and then he ran and I thought, well, how do you justify that to yourself? Because the gap of knowledge must have been painfully evident to him. And the fact that the Trudeau name, you could, you could say, well, you know, the Liberal Party came to me. That's his justification. They came to me and there wasn't another person that could win on the Liberal side and better a Trudeau Liberal, even if it's a consequence of family name than any damn conservative, let's say. So even if, even if Trudeau was motivated by compassion, it's like, yeah, just how loving are you, first of all? No, it was a really bad decision. And then he, and he's expressed contempt for monetary policy. I'm not interested in monetary policy. It's like, okay, but you're a prime minister. And he's expressed admiration for the Chinese Communist Party because they can be very efficient in their pursuit of environmental goals. It's like, oh yeah, efficiency, eh? The efficiency of the tyranny in the service of your terror. I still saw it as a manifestation of a, a really profound narcissism. I think a reasonable person would have said, I'm not prepared for this, certainly not yet. And I'm not the man that need, that there needs to be in this position. And so I don't know what you think about those musings, but that's how I looked at Trudeau. And I certainly haven't seen anything in the preceding years that has disabused me of any of those notions. I think he's a narcissist. Do you think there's a degree to which power changed him? If you're not suited for the position, if you're not the man for the position, you can be absolutely 100% sure that the power will corrupt you. How could it not? I mean, at the, at the least, if you don't have the chops for the job, you have to devalue the job to the point where you can feel comfortable inhabiting it. So, Yes, I think that it's corrupted him. And I mean, look at him doubling down. Mm. We wear masks into, in flights into Canada. We have to fill out an arrive can bureaucratic form on our phones because a passport is go isn't good enough. We can't get a passport. What if you're 85 and you don't know how to use a smartphone? Oh, well, too bad for you. Why do you think he was and still remains attractive to a substantial subset of Canadians. I mean, people seem to regard him as charming and caring. And I think he is charming in a, in a kind of shallow sense. But it isn't obvious to me at all that he's caring, but he, he, he seems to play the part and he plays it well enough so that, well, many people, and this is true of people all over the world, certainly by the, by the act, so what, what made me skeptical about Trudeau to begin with is that it wasn't obvious to me that he had the preparation for the job by any stretch of the imagination. It's a very hard job, and it is a job that would be too hard for me. I, I know that, and, and, and so I'm not saying this as someone who thinks he could step in and, and do this properly. It's a very stressful job, and it's very complicated, but I think that also means that you have to be very careful when you decide that you're the guy to do it. And if if Mr. Trudeau's last name had been anything other than Trudeau, he wouldn't have ever been the leader of the Liberal Party or the Prime Minister of Canada. And it seems to me, it isn't clear to me how you'd have to think in order to think that that was actually okay. Uh, like, what do you what do you have to think to believe that Oh, well, you know, I really don't know how to do this. I'm not prepared for it. I don't have the educational background or the experiential background, but everyone knows my name. I've got name brand recognition, man. I've really got that. And so it's okay if I'm prime minister. It's like, well, actually, it's not okay. His father, Pierre, devastated the West in 1982 with the national energy policy and Trudeau is doing exactly the same thing again. And so as a Westerner as well, I have an inbuilt animus and one that's well-deserved because Central Canada, especially the glittery, literati, elite types in the Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto triangle have exploited the West and expressed contempt for the West far too much for far too long. And that's accelerating at the moment, for example, with Trudeau's recent attack on the Canadian farmers. 
He's an enemy of the oil and, and, and gas industry. It's an utter and absolute bloody catastrophe. And look what's happened in Europe, at least in partial consequence. And he's no friend to the farmers.